Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I am thankful to Pakistan Academy of Family Physicians for inviting me today. So in next 15 to 20 minutes, I am going to talk about uh, a specific aspect of gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is a complicated gastroesophageal reflux disease. I will just go through quickly, give an overview of GERD, just to set the grounds for the further discussion. Then the next we will focus on refractory GERD because that is one complicated situation that is most commonly encountered. The patients who are not responding to our traditional or treat, treatment that we start with. And then we will touch upon the complications and where the Barrett's metaplasia is the one complication that we'll talk, we will talk in some detail. So we all know gastroesophageal reflux disease is basically a symptomatic complex or a disease which is primarily due to reflux of the gastric content into the esophagus. And interestingly, two-thirds of these patients who are symptomatic, who are diagnosed to have gastroesophageal reflux disease, their endoscopy is generally normal. So you don't find any erosion, ulcers, or changes on their endoscopy, so they are called as non-erosive reflux disease. And there are a lot of theories and a lot of mechanisms which are contributing to this problem, but the major problem with these patients is either one of these three. Either their lower esophageal sphincter is incompetent, uski competency loss ho jati hai, jiski wada se stomach ke content can easily move into the distal esophagus. Or some part of the stomach has moved into the chest, jiski wada se again the possibility of having reflux jaya ho bada jati hai. Or they are having abnormally prolonged transient LES relaxation, jo normally bhi without meal bhi kuch na kuch LES relaxation ke phases aate hai. But they have longer episodes, so more chances of getting symptoms due to the reflux of the gastric contents. So we all know that all these three things will result in one problem, that gastric acid is going to come into the distal part of the esophagus. So obviously that part of the esophagus is going to get inflamed, injured, and leading on to the symptoms like pain, burning, regurgitation. Th those are all due to this primary problem. So we are all aware of typical symptoms like retrosternal burning or bitter taste, or uh, regurgitation of gastric content. But we must be aware of atypical symptoms as well. Sometimes you will find a patient who has got a long-standing chronic cough and he is not responding to any form of the treatment. Sometimes you find a patient who has presented with asthma and he is not having good enough relief with all the bronchodilators and inhalers. And there are patients who present with their uh, decaying teeth or gingival inflammation recurrent so in this, these situations, you also have to consider the possibility of reflux disease. It's primarily a clinical diagnosis. You don't need endoscopy or pH monitoring in every patient. Uh, if you are confident enough on clinical evaluation that this is a patient of reflux disease, you can start with the treatment, uh, except for a few patients who have indications. We'll briefly touch upon that. So endoscopy and pH monitoring is not essential. So it's a, it's a clinical diagnosis, especially if you, you are not encountering a situation which is complicated or difficult. So one minute for management of GERD. There are two aspects of management. One is lifestyle modification, and the second is medication. And in lifestyle modification, important things are the timing of meal, and what to take and when to take, and the third part is about, especially for patients who are having nocturnal episodes, you advise them to raise the head end of their bed up to six, uh, six inches and reduce weight, less co caffeine and f fatty food and alcohol. Smoking is one factor which contributes to lower esophageal uh, sphincter relaxation. So that will always remain the first, first step of the management. And then we all know we use proton pump inhibitors for its management. It's generally given for at least eight weeks. And then comes the next step. If the patient is non-erosive reflux disease or you have not performed endoscopy, so you, you generally stop treatment at eight weeks, but continue with lifestyle modifications. But if somebody has reflux disease, which is documented on endoscopy, and there are severe changes, you may need to continue PPI for long term. But still, you will try after every two to three months to taper off the dose, to reduce the dose, or maybe take the patient off that particular medication. Now, now we move to the refractory GERD. Refractory GERD is a very well-known entity. Around 40% of the patients of reflux 
you will start with lifestyle uh, modifications and PPIs and they are not going to have response or they have partial response to the treatment. So what to do with that? There can be multiple reasons and just like any other disease, one of the reasons is the compliance of the drugs because it's not only the drug which needs to be taken, the time of taking drug along with all the lifestyle modifications. So that's the first thing that we need to address. But there are other aspects of this uh, situation where patient is not responding. That may be due to concomitant uh, uh, functional disorder like dyspepsia, like IBS. That needs to be evaluated and we all know that evaluation is again has to be clinical. And obviously possibility of an alternative diagnosis, especially ischemic heart disease, for somebody with retrosternal burning that, and age above 40 and risk factors like diabetes and hypertension, that should never be missed in such patients who are not responding to the proton pump inhibitors. So this entity of overlap of dyspepsia and GERD, this is very well known. And the reason for this is that there are mechanisms uh, which contribute to the both, especially the poor emptying of the uh, stomach or impaired gastric accommodation that can lead to both, both clinical conditions, dyspepsia as well as reflux disease. So around 7% of general population is suffering from this overlap. And you will find 30 to 40% patients of GERD suffering from dyspepsia or patients of dyspepsia suffering from GERD. So this is the first thing that uh, I will consider after checking the compliance of the patient to the drugs, that am I missing some other diagnosis, some co-diagnosis like dyspepsia or IBS or not? Especially in patients with NERD, this percentage according to few studies is very high, more than 30-40%, it goes up to 60-70% as well. But if I'm sure that this is pure gastroesophageal reflux disease and there is no element of dyspepsia and patient is taking PPI but he's still not responding to the treatment, what can be the reason for that? There are possibilities that patient is having reflux of the bile acids and obviously in that case your drug for lowering pH is not going to work. Then there are patients who are having normal physiological reflux, but that normal acid is also producing more symptoms because they are hypersensitive, because their receptors over the distal esophagus are more sensitive to the acid which is coming physiologically, but is producing the symptoms. And there are other theories as well, like higher prostaglandin production in these patients, and stress is also a well-known factor which can contribute to this progression as well. So how to proceed if you find a patient who has uh, <coughs> refractory GERD? So you can see this is algorithm. The first thing is clinical evaluation, exclusion of other diagnosis, then is upper G endoscopy, especially if somebody has typical symptoms. And on endoscopy, you are always going to take biopsies for eosinophilic esophagitis, and obviously you will rule out the other possible causes of similar symptoms. In case of atypical symptoms, you will take the help of ENT or pulmonology, because those symptoms like asthma, cough, sore throat, and all those, maybe there is a concomitant diagnosis from those specialities as well. But if endoscopy is normal, then is the pH monitoring. That is the test which needs to be used. Because now, in this situation, you are going to go beyond drugs. So you will need further augmentation of the, your diagnosis for proceeding for those options. So one of the indication for endoscopy in GERD is failure to improve. So this is the time that you are going to perform an endoscopy. You have to take patient off PPI for two weeks and you have to take biopsy for eosinophilic esophagitis because in that endoscopy is perfectly normal. And then is the option of pH monitoring which should be taken at this stage because the next options are basically either surgical or endoscopic. So we will go for pH monitoring especially if somebody has a GERD diagnosed on endoscopy, that pH monitoring can be done on PPI. He, he should continue taking PPI and then you will check how much acid is coming into the distal esophagus to decide that you have to go beyond PPI or not. So first thing will be compliance, dose optimization, which is timing. Then there are studies to show that those who have got nocturnal symptoms, they may be benefited by adding H2 blockers to their treatment as well. People have used baclofen, that is especially helpful in those with non-acidic reflux because it increases the tone of the distal esophagus, so reduces the acid getting back. But then comes the option of intervention. That may include surgery or that may include endoscopic intervention that they, which are now becoming more and more popular and are being used. 
In surgery, you do anti reflux surgery, that's basically a fundoplication, and <clears throat> that's beyond uh, the scope of my talk the nascent fundoplication or 270 degree or 360 degree. But remember, there is a problem of recurrence after surgery, and it was around 40 to 50 percent, maybe two, three decades back. But now, with improved surgical techniques, recent data has shown it's around 15 to 20 percent recurrence. Patients are going to use PPI even after surgery, after one year of time. This is another option, that is magnetic sphincter augmentation. Laparoscopically, you place a ring, titanium uh, bead, se bana hua ek ring hai, jo basically food ke bolus ke time per relax karta hai, otherwise valve ko competent rakta hai. And it has shown some benefit, but obviously cost is a major issue. And then they, these are new endoscopic interventions. I will not go into detail, but basically what they do is that they create a valve at gastroesophageal level. Just like we were doing in fundoplication, endoscopically you can create a valve to reduce the chances that the gastric acid will come back. But it is used in only selective situations, not in a severe esophagitis. Anti-reflux mucosectomy means they burn the area around the GE junction and then with the healing and fibrosis it is expected that that will become narrowed down. And then there are procedures like strata and all these. So. <clears throat> The last part of my talk is regarding complications, and I will just focus on the Barrett's metaplasia, which is an important complication of long-standing GERD. It is basically a, a intestinal metaplasia, that is the change of the distal epithelium of the esophagus to the intestinal epithelium, which is characterized by presence of goblet cells, and it has to be of more than one centimeter for diagnosis. And this is how it appears on endoscopy. You see a salmon pink patch getting above the gastroesophageal junction for more than one centimeter. And it this diagnosis is on biopsy, which shows the goblet cells, which are characteristics of intestinal epithelium. So I'll skip this video. It is a pre-malignant condition. Around 60% of the patients with esophageal adenocarcinoma, they do have Barrett's metaplasia at the time of diagnosis of cancers. For early gast uh, esophageal cancers, up to 90% patients have this. But on the other hand, only 10% patients with the diagnosis of cancer, they have a ca pre, uh, uh, prior diagnosis of Barrett's metaplasia. That means we are missing a big window of opportunity of diagnosing this malignant cancer at much earlier stage where we can prevent it or can manage very effectively. So it is a pre malignant condition and it needs to be diagnosed early. So how to do that is doing an endoscopy. So if somebody has GERD for last five years and there are no alarm symptoms, but are three out of these six features, male gender, obesity, smoking, or family stiff cancer should undergo upper G endoscopy with biopsies of gastroesophageal junction. And obviously you need to take certain number of biopsies from there. So what to do if you, are di if you have diagnosed Barrett's metaplasia? It's important to see is there a dysplasia or not in that particular biopsy. And that should be done by at least two histopathologists. If there is no dysplasia and the segment of Barrett's is less than three centimeter, you repeat endoscopy after three years. And if it is more than three centimeter, uh, if less than three centimeter, you repeat after five years. And if it is more than three centimeter, you repeat after three years. But if there is, in, in, that is indefinite, there is a way to address that. You repeat endoscopy after six months, then one year. But if you do find dysplasia, then you have to go for the management. The management includes either endoscopic or surgical. In low-grade dysplasia, there is an option of going for close surveillance, uh, repeating biopsies after six months and every year. But that patient can op also offer the definitive treatment as well. So what is the definitive treatment? Treatment is endoscopic mucosal resection followed by ablation. So you cut that area and burn that area down to the bottom and burn that area. Oh, depending on low grade dysplasia or high grade dysplasia, follow up which is based on the plan that you have six months, one year, and follow up or three, six, or twelve months pe continuous endoscopy and then you have to serve it. But what needs to remember is that at this stage treatment would mean that patient is not going to progress to adenocarcinoma of esophagus which has got very poor prognosis, which has got one year survival of around 20-30%. So it needs to be addressed very carefully. So that's how it is done that that part of the mucosa is sucked into the cap and then you cut across it and burn the surface which is left behind. 
and this is how it looks after a section. Now, uh, just to go through the rest of the calculations, you may find strictures, but that's very easy to manage because you just can dilate that. You may find deep ulcers, which can lead to continuous pain and failure to respond. That needs a high, a high dose of PPIs, lifestyle modification, and dose adjustment. And if we fail to diagnose Barrett's at a time, you may end up with a patient who has got advanced adenocarcinoma as well. So these are the few complications, but you can see early management, close monitoring, that can help these patients. So in summary, compliance of lifestyle modifications and PPI use is the cornerstone of this treatment of GERD. Clinical review followed by endoscopy and pH monitoring is essential in somebody who has got refractory GERD, which is not responding to your routine treatment. And Barrett's needs lifelong treatment and very close surveillance to select appropriate time for complete eradication of intestinal metabolism. Thank you very much.